I think one possible scenario is that there will, by the end of a century, be a, a few sort of crazy pioneers in a settlement on Mars. Mm. I don't buy the idea of mass migration to Mars because it's an inhospitable habitat and dealing with climate change on Earth and all that is a doddle compared to terraforming Mars. But <laughs> there will be some crazy pioneers out there and <laughs> they will be cosmically important. Welcome to Close to the Truth. I'm speaking with Martin Rees, the UK Astronomer Royal. We'll focus on humanity's existential risks. Uh, Martin, it's always good to see you. You're a very elegant, beautiful location. Good to be with you again. Let's start um, with the just breathtaking discoveries of the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, literally breathtaking, the images, the data. Uh, but I'd like to, to talk about their implications for cosmology. Uh, what are your favorite discoveries so far? Yes. Well, of course, the reason it's so special is the high quality images, the high resolution, and the fact that one can therefore observe very faint objects and see structure in them. And uh, as everyone hoped for, it has revealed a lot about galaxies um, further out in space and therefore further back in time than we knew before, uh, back to when the uh, expanding universe was only a few percent of its present age and galaxies were just forming. And we have some ideas about uh, how uh, the universe starts to develop structure as uh, gravity increases the density contrast between overdense and underdense regions in the dark matter. And we don't know so well how the gas in the universe falls into the dark matter potential wells and what the shape is of these galaxies. And uh, what's been interesting is that these distant galaxies have proved to be rather brighter and uh, more compact and have bigger black holes in them than most people guessed. I don't think it's a fundamental problem. Uh, it just means we didn't really understand how quickly uh, black holes could grow uh, in this denser environment, and also uh, that the population of stars back then will be different and biased towards heavier and brighter stars than now. So we're learning a lot. I don't think there's any fundamental mystery that's emerged, but certainly for the first time, we're getting a picture for the birth of galaxies when they're just condensing out. Uh, the, the, some of the data is just remarkable because, uh, as I read, uh, every seems few weeks they get a galaxy that's earlier and earlier. I think they're now at, uh, uh, I, I saw 500 million years be, after the Big Bang and then 450 million years. And mm -hmm. this is, uh, of course, detected by the redshift. Uh, but if it's 450, it's uh, that's less than 4% of the age of the universe. Mm -hmm. And to see this spectacular structure is uh it, it is is remarkable um and uh the early black holes the number of galaxies the density of them now what i found and what we hear at close to the truth people write to us as you would expect i assume they write to you too uh, that this has given rise to a uh, what i call a cottage industry of denying uh, the big bang cosmology uh, rejecting the so-called lambda cold dark matter model which is the, the the primary big big bang model as you've described and in fact you've had a uh, um, a very significant role in the early stages of proving the big bang in the, in in your uh, in your remarkable career and so th this cottage industry denying the big bang has always been there and i've always heard it but the, the data from, from Webb seems to have given them more life. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, of course, there are still people, a chap called Eric Lerner, who doesn't think it was a big bang at all, of course. Yeah, He's right. on uh, lots of shows. Um, and, of course, there are lots of uncertainties. But uh, I would like to say two things. First, I don't think what we've learned from the Webb telescope uh, does anything to diminish our confidence in the Lambda CDM model, because um, it's tells us about how the gas behaves in a universe where the dominant material is dark matter. And mm. uh, the behavior of, uh, of gas is very complicated, shock waves and cooling and winds and things. And we didn't understand that very well. And uh, we're learning about it from James Webb because it can look back further 
in time and see things. But I don't think it really weakens our view about the um, uh, lambda cold of matter model. And just to summarize the situation as I see it, um, it's rather amazing that I think we can trace cosmic history and outline back to when the universe had been expanding for no more than a microsecond. Mm. Um, and at that time, it was at all at supernuclear densities. Um, and uh, uh, the entire observable universe today would have been compressed to smaller than the solar system. Hmm. Why don't I go back still further than a microsecond? The reason is that that's the era when every particle has about the energy which we can produce in the world's biggest accelerators, the one engineering. Hmm. If you want to go back further, we lose our foothold in experiment. And I think it's accepted by most cosmologists that to answer some of the fundamental questions like why is the universe expanding the way it is? Why is it the shape it is? Uh, why does it contain the ingredients that we observe, dark matter and atoms, etc.? We need to go back much, much, much further. Indeed, in an idea called the inflationary universe, we have to go back till the observable universe was squeezed not merely smaller than our solar system, but down to the size of a tennis ball. That's a huge mm -hmm. extrapolation. And of course, we have lots and lots of ideas about what the physics might be, but none are battle tested by observation. So uh, we have traced things back to a microsecond, um, but a lot can happen before that if you think on a log scale. So I think this is a great, great achievement of cosmology in the last uh, 50 years, because when I was a student, we didn't even know there was a Big Bang at all. And mm. it settled in the mid-1960s. And as you know, things have been filled in, um, not by armchair theorists, but by better and better experiments and uh, uh, more powerful telescopes, plus, incidentally, more powerful computer simulations. So we can actually do virtual experiments, uh, which, of course, astronomers can never do in the real world. And and James Webb, there are two two uh, kind of technological uh, factors. One is that it sees in the infrared, so that it 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 it, it dust uh, it can see beyond the what we see in the in the in the visual spectrum. And the second is um, the the spectacular use of gravitational lensing to to see the ancient galaxies behind the others. You describe each of those very very briefly. Um, yes, well, it's able to observe by being above the atmosphere um, at wavelengths which are absorbed by water vapor, etc. And so that's very important because um, uh, in uh, very distant objects, what is emitted as visible light has its wavelength stretched and receives, uh, is received in the um, infrared. So to see the key features and most of the radiation emitted by these distant galaxies, you've got to go into the infrared. And of course, it's a very well-figured mirror, six and a half meters across. I should say that um, uh, in terms of light collecting power, it'll be superseded in a few years by the world's biggest ground-based telescope, which is called the Extremely Large Telescope, being built by a consortium of European countries in Chile. And this has a mirror 39 meters across. Not mm -hmm. one piece of glass, but a mosaic of 800 pieces of glass. And uh, that will uh, uh, collect more light but that won't go into the infrared mm -hmm. the other thing actually before we finish with the space telescope is that um an equally exciting new development which we're getting from the james webb which involves being able to see in the infrared um and uh, which is going to be exciting in the next few years is um quite different from looking at high redshifts it's looking for planets orbiting other stars mm -hmm. and the most exciting things in the last 10 years has been the realization that most of the stars in the sky, if we see when we look up, are like our sun and are orbited by retinues of planets, just like the uh, sun is orbited by the Earth and other familiar planets. And so uh, we now know that most stars have um, a range of planets, some rather like the Earth, some rather like Jupiter. And these um, have been detected indirectly by uh, uh, their shadows, as it were, when they move in front of their parent star. Um, they're very much fainter, of course, than the stars themselves. But these um, uh, new telescopes will be able to uh, collect enough light that one will see the light from the planet itself. And to give an example, um, supposing that um, 
you were an alien looking at our solar system, then if you were, say, 100 light years away, the sun would look an ordinary star and the earth would look, in Carl Sagan's nice phrase, like a pale blue dot, very close in the sky to its star, our sun, but many millions of the times fainter and very hard to detect. But if you had a telescope powerful enough to detect that pale blue dot from 100 light years away, then you could learn quite a bit about it because the shade of blue you'd see would be slightly different depending on whether the Pacific Ocean or the landmass of Asia was facing you. So by watching, the aliens looking at the Earth could infer that there were continents and oceans. They could infer the length of the day. And by taking a spectrum of the lights, they could probably infer that there was lots of green stuff on the Earth and a lot of oxygen. And issues like that can be addressed for Earth-like planets orbiting other nearby stars. We're just starting. In fact, hmm. one of my colleagues was lead author on a paper last month, uh, which found um, some kind of um, uh, heavy elements indicating possible biological activity in one of these exoplanets. But we can expect a lot more of that soon. Hmm. Uh, re remarkable. And the way we do that is we see the light of the star going through the atmosphere on a very, uh, 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 as it transits, it, 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 instead of one when it transits you can see there's a planet but if you look very very carefully and, and yes. the light right direction you you can see the light from the star through the atmosphere and then get a spectrographic re reading i think one of the things i discovered was water vapor uh, in planets and that that's helped understand the planetary formation process because Webb has helped us understand both ste galactic stellar and planetary formation process um in in how it, it came together how the protoplanetary disks formed and water vapor has a, an issue so just just a remarkable uh a fire hose of uh of not just data but uh but real implications for how the universe works yes. uh, <laughs> and of course uh, we should give credit 90 percent to the technologists who designed it and made it work and of course it was a, a very tense time when it was launched, but they hadn't unfurled the uh, uh, the mirror. Oh. And I think oh. we, should, we should give some credit to uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX because his new big rocket, the big, the big one, uh, yes. is going to be able to launch 100 tons of stuff into low Earth orbit. Hmm. And that could have launched something heavier and more robust than the James Webb telescope and could have launched the mirror six and a half meters across in one piece in the nose cone. And so wow. this augurs well for much cheaper counterparts to the James Webb telescope uh, being launched in the next decade or two um, mm -hmm. using the availability of, um, uh, uh, of, of these large uh, rockets, which are reusable and cheap, and also um, uh, the fact that you can carry more weight and therefore don't need to um, make something uh, rather delicate in order to not exceed the weight limit. Uh, uh, amazing. Well, you and I got to keep really healthy so we can do another update two or three decades from now. <laughs> well, Martin, let's uh, let's go into our next session, uh, a section on uh, existential risk. And I, I want to precede it by giving you a proper bio uh, very briefly. Uh, Martin Reese has been astronomer royal since 1995. So getting close to 30 years. Uh, he is former president of the Royal Society, fellow and former master of Trinity College uh, in Cambridge, and emeritus professor of cosmology and astrophysics at Cambridge. He has made seminal contributions to Big Bang cosmology, galaxy formation, black holes, and quark quasars. Everything we're talking about now, Martin was in at the very beginning and helped create it. Uh, his visionary book, uh, Just Six Numbers, which is what we discussed in our very first meeting, uh, like uh, uh, 15 years ago, uh, describes the deep forces that shape the universe and had a very important effect. Still a very important book uh, recommended to everyone. His most recent book, If Science is to Save Us, describes the astonishing capacity of advanced knowledge and technology to determine the future of our planet and how we need to think rationally, globally, and long term. So, Martin, this brings us to existential risk. And I'd like to begin by asking you to describe the Center for the Study of Existential Risk at Cambridge, which you co-founded. Well, I think um, one feature of the present century is that there's a new 
class of threats that uh, has come on the scene, which didn't worry us in the past. It's the effect of humans on the planet. And these are of two kinds. There are uh, collective impacts because there are more of us on the planet. There are 8 billion of us, all more demanding of energy resources. And we are collectively um, changing the uh, Earth's environment, climate change, etc., and possible destruction of biodiversity, etc. And these are sort of gradual insidious threats which could become catastrophic later in the century. That's one thing. The other different class of threats comes from the misuse of powerful technology. We, of course, had nuclear weapons for more than half a century now, um, but what is more my nightmare is that we have new technologies, um, um, cyber and especially bio, in my opinion, uh, where it's likely that um, uh, individuals or even small groups of evil intent could be able to engineer viruses far worse than the natural ones like COVID-19. And we have threats of that kind, which we need to try and deal with. Um, and uh, what our center is trying to do is to analyze how serious these threats are so that we can dismiss the ones that are still science fiction and focus on the ones that are becoming real from reasonable extrapolations of present technology. Um, and also, more important, how we can prepare for them if they do happen and minimize the chance that they ever do happen. And so um, I think the main concern that some of us have had is that um, while there's a huge industry of people thinking about the safety of flight and um, roads and all that, the number of people thinking about the downsides of these new technologies has been relatively small, probably just one or two hundred worldwide. And uh, uh, we've just celebrated the 10th anniversary of a little centre that I co-founded, uh, which contains people with expertise in um, uh, economics, uh, computer science, genetics, etc., cetera, um, who are thinking about these various threats. Um, and uh, we were dismissed as doom mongers, but I think COVID-19 was an example which mm. shows that we are in a more interconnected world when a disaster can't be confined to a single country or even a single continent, we have the possibility of worldwide uh, effects from a single uh, event. And that's true, obviously, of pandemics, real ones and engineered ones. Um, it also could be true um, if we have um, attacks on the, uh, on the internet or on other f facilities which we need for our sustenance. Uh, it, it's a, a critical fact, and even though the, all of the threats have low probabilities, in a sense, because the impact of them have such gigantic uh, um, effect, uh, as you say in your mission statement, we're dedicated to the study and mitigation of risk that could lead to human extinction or civilizational collapse, mm -hmm. that the weighted average of the percentage of likelihood versus the impact should give much greater importance to the to the whole endeavor. Now, you, you, you distinguish between study and mitigation. So first specific thing I'd like to understand is what you call a science of global risk, which you apply to these diverse categories. So what is the science of, of global risk in terms of its methodologies that can be applied to each of the kinds of categories of the, what those risks are? Well, it's really being aware of the actual <clears throat> Um, nature and scientific prospects in these different areas of science. Um, if we think of the uh, the long term threats, I mean, obviously, everyone knows that um, we need to understand climate change more and its effects on uh, biodiversity and things of that kind, and that that's something which uh, uh, needs more detailed scenarios than we have now in order to make confident planning uh, several decades ahead. And of course, in the context of um, uh, um, bio, then of course uh, we need to ask can we regulate new techniques, so-called gain-of-function experiments, which can make a virus more virulent and more transmissible so that we can take advantage of the benefits but minimize the chances of a uh, misuse. And I think this is the thing that I worry most about because um, uh, you can't build a nuclear weapon without conspicuous special purpose facilities which can be monitored uh, whereas you can engineer a virus 
um, in the kind of laboratory which exists in many com companies and many universities. And I worry very much that even if there is um, uh, a regulatory regime which is international, enforcing it is going to be as hard as enforcing the drug laws or the tax laws globally. We can't mm -hmm. do all of those things. And so I genuinely think uh, that uh, we are going to have to accept more intrusive surveillance of all the people with the relevant expertise. It's not something we, we want, but I think uh, the risk is so high that that's something which um, many of us feel we're going to have to accept. Um, and also um, maybe there are going to be similar issues which are rather high in the news in the last two or three months regarding AI and its developments. And so it's just that what is new is that um, uh, technology allows a few people to cause a disaster of global impact. And in our more interconnected world, then it's more likely that a local disaster can spread globally. Yeah, and this is always the, the challenge of when you have rules, all the good guys will obey them. And, and all the bad guys will not. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why you say we have to be more intrusive. And that, that's the, the classic trade-off between uh, privacy and individual rights and, uh, and, and, and human safety, um, which many of us in the past have skewed to the human rights and individual privacy uh, for obvious reasons. But what you're saying is we have to rethink that. And that's the characteristic of what we call authoritarian regimes that are very intrusive in people's lives that we object to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so well, I think we have to go that way, at least for a subset of people who we suspect have the expertise to do this sort of thing. I think they have to accept that. But um, we all accept CCTV cameras in public spaces, etc. So I, I don't think many of us would object um, to having a bit more surveillance. Um, but there's another different issue, which is that um, uh, if to take the uh, issue that's been in the news uh, just in the weeks before we're speaking, um, there's been a lot on AI and yes. that needs to be regulated uh, for a number of grounds. But here the special problem is that the major players are multinational conglomerates. Uh, which are very hard to regulate because they operate in many different jurisdictions. And just as they avoid paying a fair level of tax because they can register in Ireland or somewhere like that, even though they don't do business there because they've got a lower rate of tax, um, then uh, uh, they could, if they wished, um, evade any regulations. And very hard to enforce them. And that's a special problem for that particular technology, which is dominated by a few big companies. Uh, risks from artificial intelligence is one of the major content categories uh, for the Center for the Study of Existential Risk that you that you have. Um, in the last few weeks, as you said, this has been a hot a hot topic. Um, the Prime Minister of England had a, had a summit with the key people, and so this focus on it. Uh, what what is your assessment of that? I mean, there's a lot of uh, of hot language about uh, artificial intelligence becoming conscious and uh, which I think is um, is is not justified um, but that gives me a sense of wanting to dismiss all of the problems pretty pretty quickly uh, but uh, I, I, I you know you're saying that it is a serious problem so let's let's uh, kind of go a little bit in depth in terms of the risks of artificial intelligence what artificial intelligence is today uh, and what it theoretically could be. Yes. Um, well, let me start at the end by saying that I'm very sceptical about these doomsday scenarios, about the um, uh, um, superhuman general intelligence that's going to take over the world. I think that's a long way away. Uh, in particular, uh, people tend to think we're closer because they don't realize that chat GBT doesn't understand the world at all. It just understands how words are correlated. Right. Uh, sentences. Um, it doesn't uh, understand uh, the external world and doesn't have sense organs that enable it to do, do that. But going back to answer your question, of course, um, there are present day concerns, uh, which I think do require better regulation. Um, well, from social media already, you know, the um, uh, fake news um, and obscenity and all that. Um, and uh, of course, um, uh, fake news 
um, is going to be more easily generated with the uh, extra power that AI offers. So that, that's one thing. And um, I, I think the other point, which is accepted by everyone, is that um, uh, there's going to be some uh, um, upheavals in the labour market. And uh, obviously the kind of jobs that could be taken over more, most readily by AI um, are um, uh, routine jobs of various kinds. Um, but many professional jobs can be at least uh, very much aided by AI, um, you know, um, uh, computer programming, um, uh, radiology, even surgery, um, legal work, using the huge body of literature, which can be accessed by uh, an AI, um, all, all those. Um, and of course, uh, um, uh, simple manual work and call centers and things like that can. Um, incidentally, um, if you want to have a guaranteed job, your cope won't be taken over. I think the best bet would be to be a plumber or a gardener, because <laughs> those very non-routine, skilled, blue-collar jobs uh, <laughs> are going to be very hard indeed to imagine being taken over. So mm -hmm. they're the ones to, to buy. But um, to, to look on the upside, um, uh, I think um, if we can uh, replace mind-numbing jobs like working in an Amazon warehouse um, or in a call center by machine, um, that's fine, provided that those who were working there don't end up unemployed, but can be given jobs in an arena where being human is important. And I'm thinking of uh, um, uh, carers for young and old, assistance to teachers, custodians into public parks, and all the things that make life for the ordinary person better. And so what I think would be an improvement would be um, if uh, there was a higher taxation rate, especially on these big companies, and the proceeds uh, sort of quasi-hypothecated, as it were, for um, public sector jobs in mm. sectors of um, caring um, and teaching assistants, etc., um, to provide more dignified work uh, in these areas um, that are more needed and where at the moment there's a tremendous shortage in there. And I think we, we need that. And it's part of my my mantra that um, uh, uh, we in Britain uh, should lead this because we, we should learn more from Scandinavia and less from the US and be prepared yeah. to pay higher taxes for yeah. a proper welfare state. And mm. not the enormous inequalities in not just wealth, but in consequent life expectancy between the uh, bottom 10 percent and the rest in the U.S. We don't want to re repeat that. Mm. Uh, one of the categories that you have uh, on the center is global justice and uh, global catastrophic risk. That's normally not thought of as a um, an existential risk is global uh, injustice. Mm. And so you're addressing that now. And that to me has always been interesting because artificial AI, biotechnology, uh, climate change, those are the sort of the big three and those are the obvious ones. But you have global injustice or making global justice as also a potential catastrophic risk. Yes. Well, that's in a sense what you were saying. But uh, I think we've got to be aware that there are not only excessive inequalities within countries, but between countries, and in particular um, between the, uh, the the global north and the global south, um, the, the huge differences in mean incomes and life expectancies and everything like that. And um, uh, it seems to me it should be a goal of policies uh, to uh, uh, reduce that inequality and do all we can by a mega Marshall plan or similar um, joint developments uh, to re reduce the gap between yeah. the uh, rich and poor countries. And this will be uh, not just for altruistic reasons, because in the poorest parts of the world, unlike 100 years ago, they know what they're missing. They may not have, they may not have toilets, but they have the internet. They know what life is like for us compared for them, and they know the injustice of their fate. Um, and also migration is easier. So if you want to uh, um, allow those countries to develop so that the motive for mass migration is reduced, then I think we do need to ensure um, that um, uh, they can um, develop their education system, that their talent isn't drained away to the north, and that they can, uh, uh, in particular, um, develop their own um, uh, clean energy 
sources and things like that. Because to mention climate change, um, if we in the global north achieve net zero um, by 2050, which is difficult but not impossible, then that won't be any good if at that same time uh, the countries that are now uh, very undeveloped um, uh, develop in the way that India has, so they burn lots of coal to get there. Right. Um, the four billion people in the global south could by global could by then by 2050 be producing as much CO2 annually as we are in the north today, and we've been no closer to net zero than we are now. So for our altruistic reasons and for other reasons. Uh, we want to um, narrow the gap and allow them to develop. And of course, um, if we do that, then that will probably um, uh, uh, reduce the uh, current um, uh, growth rate of the population in those countries. Yeah. Uh, I, I do want to go back to an earlier comment. We were talking about AI, which is the uh, kind of the hot topic today in, in terms of uh, you're not a doomsdayer in terms of it'll take over the world. I, I'm exactly the same also about the nature of AI consciousness and our and, and our moral responsibility to the machine not to turn it off. Um, but you had a, 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 a disclaimer in there saying for the foreseeable future. Uh, wh wh what, what is that ultimate future? In, in other words, in principle, could that happen? And given any time frame that you want, not just the uh, decades, but millennia or or millions of years. I, I'm looking for the asymptote um, uh, yeah. theoretical possibility uh, from your perspective of AI. Well, I mean, uh, I think we can't predict the future of our species beyond one century, the most, because uh, um, although, uh, although um, uh, we have better predictive uh, procedures um things are changing very fast and um uh, i i think we can't predict what would happen even a century from now and this of course is an impediment to planning because we don't know how to, how to deal with it we just could be got to be cautious and to take one example um uh, what, what about expanding uh, humanity beyond the earth and this has been discussed um in fact i wrote another book with my colleague Don Goldsmith called the end of astronaut, which is about the uh, uh, the way in which um, um, we might extend our influence beyond the Earth into space. I personally uh, think that uh, uh, as robots get better, then most of the things we want done in space, whether it's science or manufacturing uh, uh, entities, can be done by robots without sending people. And I say that if I were an American. I wouldn't support NASA's man program because it's very expensive because it had to be so risk averse. The shuttle failed twice in 135 launches. Each of those was a disaster. And if there was a NASA program to send people to Mars, then they'd probably go on spending more and more money trying to bring the risk down below 2%, which would frankly be impossible given all the hazards of going to Mars and coming back. So um, human space flights, in my view, should be left to the private sector who can launch the many um, adventurers who'd be prepared to go, even if the risk was very high, even for one one way trip. And in fact, Elon Musk has said that he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. And yeah, I think yeah. he's two years old now, so 40 years from now, he might might make it and good luck to him. So, so I think one possible scenario is that there will, by the end of a century, be a, a few sort of crazy pioneers in a settlement on Mars. Hmm. I don't buy the idea of mass migration to Mars because it's an inhospitable habitat and dealing with climate change on Earth and all that is a doddle compared to terraforming Mars. But <laughs> there, will some, there will be some crazy pioneers out there and <laughs> they will be cosmically important. And the reason for that is that by the end of a century, we can confidently predict, I think, that the um, uh, uh, technology of um, genetic enhancement of humans and cyborg technology is going to be very advanced. We're mm -hmm. probably going to want to regulate that here on Earth for uh, prudential and uh, ethical reasons. But these crazy guys on Mars will be away from the regulators. Moreover, they have every incentive to use these techniques because they're ill-adapted to their habitat, whereas we are well-adapted to living on the Earth. And so... I think within a few hundred years, the progeny 
of those pioneer Martians will be almost a new species. Mm. Whether they mm. will be still flesh and blood or whether they be electronic, we can't proceed. And that's only a few hundred years. And as you mm. said, um, the, um, uh, the, the solar system has hundreds of billions of years ahead, hundreds of millions of years ahead of it. Um, and uh, uh, we don't know what could happen on that far longer time scale. Um, because um, uh, evolution, when it's what I call secular intelligent design, driven by machines, making better machines, etc., is far faster than Darwinian selection. <laughs> that's a remarkable, uh, a remarkable vision. Oh, well, so that's the... that's, a, that's one vision, but uh, uh, this just highlights the fact that uh, it's very hard to predict um, what can happen um, more than 50 or 100 years ahead. But I think what's sufficient for us to know is that um, uh, what happens in the next 50 years does depend crucially on decisions made in the next decade. Um, one is whether we can uh, control climate change um, and whether we can prevent loss of biodiversity, which, uh, um, to quote uh, E.O. Wilson, the great ecologist, will be the sin that future generations would at least forgive us for if we destroy most of the wonder and beauty of nature. Um, and uh, uh, we... we need also to control AI and all that, as we've discussed. So we've got to ensure that um, we make the right decisions because, as I say, this is the first century in the 45 million centuries that the Earth's existed already when one species, ours, controls the planet's future. And it could um, uh, snuff everything out or produce such a great setback that technology is destroyed um, or it could um, lead towards this immense diversity spreading beyond the Earth. And this raises incidentally a question which you brought up a moment ago. Um, if we are uh, uh, usurped or superseded by electronic entities, will they be conscious? And uh, again, um, uh, this is one of the great scientific mysteries. Um, we don't know about it. But when I've written articles ab ab about this sort of scenario, there's been an interesting response from readers. Um, uh, some say, well, um, if uh, the universe in the future is populated by far more intelligent entities spreading through the galaxy, etc., this is great. Whereas others say, um, if none of these entities have consciousness and there's no intelligence able to uh, appreciate the wonder and mystery of creation, isn't this sad? So the question of whether intelligent robots are zombies because intelligence is something peculiar to flesh and blood entities or whether anything sufficiently uh, complex um, uh, undergoes an emergence of intelligence. That's a very important question. It's a philosophical question, but it may become practical ethics in the next century. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, very quickly on some super long tail risks that people talk about sometimes, very, very quickly, uh, asteroid or comet impact, a nearby supernova that that uh, sterilizes all life, or a fall to vacuum, a new inflation that kind of sucks up the whole universe, alien invasions. And yeah. Any any of those uh, you know keep you up at night? <laughs> well, I think the point is that uh, um, things like asteroid impacts and volcanoes, et cetera, uh, they they can happen, and as the dinosaurs knew, they can be very serious if they happen. But the the point is that they're not getting any more likely year by year. Mm, mm. And uh, we, we, we can calculate them. We know what the chance is of a one kilometer size asteroid hitting the Earth, etc. And uh, obviously, uh, if we can prevent that, that's fine. But it's not getting any worse, and it's not the kind of thing that keeps me awake at night. What really does keep me awake at night are the, um, the risks, and I put um, things to do with AI and uh, bio threats due to engineered pandemics. Those are probably increasing year by year. And uh, yes, even if they're small now, they may not be small in 20 years. And so we've got to worry about them. And, uh, uh, and so although uh, we, we shouldn't ignore natural threats from outside like asteroids, then they're not the most worrying thing that's we're going to encounter this century. Uh, last question. Um, it's an unfair one, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, what odds do you give uh, for a catastrophic event this century? And which categories might it come from? Uh, 
what kind of percentages would you use? Um, well, I, th I think um, I'm going to give a slightly blurred answer because um, I, I don't think anything's likely to actually wipe out all human life. I think that's very un unlikely. Um, but but I do worry this is a, uh, that we're going to have a bumpy ride through the century. Um, and um, uh, our society is so interconnected and so readily disrupted. I mean, for instance, think of what happens if the electricity grid fail sure. in the eastern United States for a week or something. Uh, that would create real ca chaos and social breakdown. Um, and so events like that, I think, are very likely to occur. So I think the world is getting, in a sense, more anarchic because small numbers of people and uh, quite modest-looking bits of technology can have these global resonances. Uh, so uh, I think we have a sort of bumpy ride um, and uh, uh, not smooth progress towards the kind of utopia we all want. So I'm pessimistic in that sense, um, but um, the kind of event that would wipe out everyone, I mean, one can imagine some, but it's it's un unlikely. And um, uh, uh, of course, the, the second worst scenario is if, um, uh, uh, if, if it was all, almost everyone was wiped out, except for some South Sea Island. And so if the only survivors were um, the indigenous population, plus a few of these uh, um, uh, uh, right-wing extremists like Peter Thiel. How would they get on with each other? And how would the species survive if it was just, just uh, uh, left with people like those two categories? <laughs> Martin, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to see you and to, and to, and to really hear your wisdom. Uh, uh, the two parts of our conversation strike me. Our universe is exhilarating and our earth is sobering. Viewers can watch dozens of TV episodes and hundreds of exclusive videos on cosmology, including many with Martin Rees and other distinguished physicists and cosmologists on the Closer to Truth website and the Closer to Truth YouTube channel. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.